Chapter 5, The Evolving Sales Cycle. Many people have a negative impression of what sales is because they're still caught up in the idea that sales is a greasy, pushy ploy to get someone to buy what they have. And if sales is about manipulation and coercion, to force someone to buy something that doesn't work and yet promises to be everything, this is the snake oil sales process, selling a product that no one wanted or needed, and yet somehow people bought because of all the false promises it made. A man stood on the wooden soapbox at a fair, plugging his cure-all potion. This played out later with the impression we have of our discount used car salesperson who said whatever he had to in order to get you to buy that lemon. It was the, I have it and you need it. And that person would inflate the price to whatever the market would bear. There is little to this type of sale. The prospect knows they have a problem. And before the days of internet and easily accessible research, there was little the prospect could do to find the solution to their problem on their own. They could go to the library and read up on any topic they desired, but many chose to skip that step and go directly to the seller, trusting that person to be honest. They'd hear the information firsthand and then make a decision from there, oftentimes making their decision quicker than they felt comfortable with because the salesperson used a pressure technique such as this is our last one or there's another buyer coming within the hour. This type of sales process still does exist, but those who use it will not be in business for very long because with the power of social media and online reviews, people will not stand for it. We are protective of others and we want to ensure any person in which we are doing business is ethical and reputable in their delivery of their promises. The Challenger Model As technology took over and internet forums became available, buyers met in online communities to read the experiences of others. It was not enough for the salesperson just to push their product to the buyer. The buyer needed to be convinced before connecting with the seller that they were interested in potentially purchasing. Oftentimes, unless the client knew they had a problem, there was nothing for which to search. The challenger model fixed this by focusing on the problem the client might potentially be facing. In simplistic terms, the salesperson approached the client and started the conversation with, do you suffer from? The client, now in agreement, became more receptive to hear what the salesperson wanted to offer as a solution to the problem they'd only recently discovered was a problem. The challenger model focused on the problems the client had. It focused on the consequences of these problems and in a way became the new method for salespeople who wanted to set themselves apart as the new trusted advisor gain trust first in the pain, and then provide a solution to that problem. The salesperson became well-versed in asking, do you suffer? What is your challenge? What pain keeps you up at night? And so on. The intention being that as long as the salesperson focused on the pain and suffering of the client, there was always something to fix. That pain was conveniently fixed by purchasing the seller's product or service. Unfortunately, as information became more prevalent, the challenger model did not age well. Buyers no longer needed their salespeople to inform them of problems. They had the internet. If they had a problem, they could source the solution online. WebMD became the most recognizable solution provider in this space, and in effect, most websites mimic that level of information. The internet became a jungle of symptoms and diagnoses. When a patient went to WebMD's site, they filled out their symptoms, checking boxes and reading the little information pop-ups. When they were suffering from a certain symptom or not, occasionally hypochondria set in and the boxes were selected just to be safe. After seven minutes filling out an online survey, the patient got a printout of all the possible issues from which they could be suffering, the most serious at the top. Then the patient went to their doctor's office with a 15-page printed document and told the doctor that they already knew they needed to, and to prescribe them a specific pharmaceutical listed in the report. Today, our clients are no different. Unless we are approaching them for the first time and they have no idea they have a specific problem, they have already self-diagnosed themselves with the sources of their challenges and have searched out or sourced WikiHow to find the most appropriate Band-Aid fix. When we approach our clients for the first time with a problem-centric model, the answer we most typically get is that there is no problem. Because there really isn't. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it was a real problem, they would have already done something about it. The problem they are facing may be too big, but the solution they were able to source took too much time, cost too much money, or became too more involved than it was worth. The client likely decided the problem wasn't big enough to have solved. 
How do you help someone who doesn't have a problem? You can't. You can spend energy trying to convince someone of a problem they really don't have or that they have to completely change the conversation. Goal-based selling. In the new sales conversation, we move away from the client's problems and focus on their goals and aspirations. A conversation around the client's goals and aspirations becomes product and service independent. We question the client about where we want to be in their future. And although we may talk about five or 10 years in the future, many clients use these goals as a guideline as opposed to a specific plan. We are most interested in short-term goals, six months to a maximum of two years. Short-term goals are tangible. We can help someone get there easily. We provide feedback and advice and help direct a plan and help the client get to their goals faster. Goal-based selling is the epitome of working with someone on creating a relationship. Buyer and seller relationship aside, when we connect with someone in our lives, in our personal relationships, the reason we choose to date and eventually marry one person over another is because they match and align with our goals. Our dreams and ambitions match with what the other person desires, and we believe by working together, that person will help us get them there faster. When we start our sales conversation, we will surround our questions around the topic of where do you want to be in six months and what would this look like for you? Every client should have some goals for themselves or their business. If they don't, why are they here? As the client tells us our goals, our job is not to jump right in right away and help them, but rather understand the impact of not getting there. What would that mean for their business and why now achieving their goal is important to them? We cannot help anyone unless they are motivated to act. Only after we understand the ramifications of someone not achieving their goal can we then move to how our product or service will help them get there faster. Example of goal-based selling. I provide my calendar booking link in almost every email I send. I encourage anyone to book me and I am happy to provide phone call support in whatever the person is struggling with in getting more sales and ultimately achieving their goals. My next meeting is with a woman named Ashley. Ashley tells me how she's currently working as a day home operator, but no longer wants to do that. What she dreams about is starting another business, one where she's doing professional photography for businesses. She dreams of going into an office and taking corporate headshots and office environment shots, which will be used for websites and promotional material. How soon do you want that to become a reality? I ask her. As soon as possible, she replies. What would you like your business to be producing in six months? Dollars, clients, type of work? I dig further. I would love to be making my day home income in six months. Right now I'm bringing in 3,600 a month. I don't know how many clients that would be, but if I was charging $600 a client, I would need six per month, she replies. Her response is not uncommon for when I'm helping people undercover their dreams and turning it into an action plan for the first time. Ashley is dreaming but she's dreaming too small. She could easily charge more than $600 per client, especially if she's doing an entire company's headshots and other photography for promotional materials. But I don't jump into that topic just yet. Goal-based selling starts off entirely about the client and how they picture their dreams evolving. I don't want to provide her with too many new ideas until I fully understand the dream she's created. And what would being able to do only photography do for you And your family, I question. People dream of a better life, not just for themselves, but because of the impact it will have on others. Many of us dream about the impact on our families, whether that is to provide them with a better life, be home more, or give them experiences such as traveling that we always wanted for ourselves, and by default, our loved ones. Other people dream of the impact that they will have providing to the world, the legacy they would like to leave for others. I want to know how many more people more people their dreams touch. What would it mean to affect that many people in ways one could imagine? It's easy to give up on a dream when the only person we may potentially disappoint is ourselves. If we try and fail, it's okay. Nobody needs to know. If we've committed to others and try, failure becomes less of an option and also harder to admit. I would be able to attend my children's field trips if I wasn't running the day home, she says. And I would be a a happier mother to my children. Now we're getting somewhere. And how would that make you feel? I ask. 
I hear the sound of her deep breath. Then life would be perfect, she slowly lets out. I am satisfied with that answer. No longer am I trying to help her move her income from full-time day home operator to full-time corporate photographer. I will actually impact her life in bigger ways. I am helping her be there more for her children. I am helping her create a perfect life in her head. That's so much more valuable than just replacing income from one source to another. Goal-based selling drives to the deepest levels of why we are helping the other person. What does it ultimately mean to the other person when we have this accomplished? Asking more questions during the goal discovery portion of the meeting, they will always be your guiding light. When the client becomes confused on eventually taking action to move forward in a deal, remind them that it's not just their goals, but the reasons and those impacts of those goals will have on their lives. The KO Advantage Sales Cycle. The sales cycle we've created and promote within our students is broken down into six simple steps. The first five steps cover the sales cycle to get to the first deal, with the sixth step covering what to do after the sale is made. After all, the best champions of your business are current and previous clients who are standing on the mountaintop singing your praises. Although the title of each stage of the sales cycle is based on what you need to focus on as the seller, below the title is the summary of where the buyer is on their own journey. Finally, there are a few tips on what, as a seller, you need to be clear before moving the sale to the next stage of the cycle. The seller and buyer relationship is no different than any other relationship you may be in. You may try to push your own agenda, but it won't matter. If the person feels they are being pushed into something they aren't ready for, they will leave. We will know where we are based on where the buyer is in their own decision-making process. Every relationship involves two parts. We cannot move forward until we are in agreement on where we are together and we're on the same page to achieve our goals faster. But before we cover each of the stages on what to do as a seller in the relationship, let's recognize how our sales cycle will align with the buyer's journey. We will use the buyer as a reference point to navigate us to ask the right questions in order to move us along the path together. In the PDF document below is the entire six step sales cycle process. Connect with us on our website for the detailed PDF, which you can actually download and print off for your own reference.